Hi, my name is Jessica Reichmuth. I'm an associate professor of bio biological sciences at Augusta University, and I'm going to be talking to today about some of the research we've been doing in the Cintilla River estuary. Title of my talk, If They Close It, Will the Fish Come Back? How Noise Cut Affects Fish Populations in the Cintilla River Estuary. I'd also like to acknowledge my two co-authors, Dr. Lauren Matthews from Georgia Southern, and the true fish biologist of this project, Dr. Bruce Saul, uh, my colleague, in the Department of Biological Sciences at Augusta University. Humans have a long history in altering, altering salt marshes as well as estuaries, and we've done so in a variety of manners. We've created ditches in order to channelize to mitigate insect control. We've cut them. Um, we also have dug navigational channels. And when we do that, that does two main things, two physical changes. It can alter water flow in the system as well as reposition the sediments. So things that, that come along with altered water flow are salt water making, to, making it to places where it hasn't been before, decreasing freshwater into areas, and that diminishes the salinity gradient of estuaries, which also, when you have altered water flow, that can reposition the sediments in the system. It can cause shoaling, a decrease in creek, creek width, um, also, some types, we often, often see changes in grain size. When we put those two together, that often disrupts the important biological cues organisms use to navigate estuaries as well as the salt marsh channels, specifically diadromous fish and mobile invertebrates. So if you um, have forgotten where you are today and you don't know where the Satilla River estuary is, I'm hoping that by looking at this map, I can give you an idea where we are. If you're familiar with where the Coastal Resources Division Office is here in Brunswick, where my pointer is circling Brunswick here, and you may be familiar with the Interstate 95 corridor that runs north and south along our seaboard, seaboard from Maine to Florida. Um, if you're less familiar with Georgia, we have a series of barrier islands. Jekyll Island is a state park, um, and Cumberland Island is a national seashore, and the river that basically empties out here is St. Andrew Sound, where this purple star is. So the Satilla River is one of the longest blackwater rivers in the state of Georgia and drains as far west as the Okefenokee Swamp. Um, but the Satilla River estuary is the portion that we're going to concentrate on today. When starting this project, um, we um, found a report by McMahon um, who was um, out of the Savannah office, Savannah District Office for the U.S. Or Army Corps of Engineers and had started looking at some of the issues that were going on in the Satilla River system. And he found this old surveyed map. So this is a map of Camden County that was drawn based on surveys from the late 1800s. The two creeks, tidal channels or tidal creeks that I want to call your attention to here um, are Umbrella Creek here that are to, is to the north and then to the south is Dover Creek, and here obviously St. Andrew Sound. But all of this shaded portion here is uninterrupted, uncut um, salt marsh. So after that survey was conducted, in a period of about 30 years, eight cuts were made in the Satilla River estuary. Um, 1910 noise cut was dug out by hand. Um, in the 1915 um, time period, both umbrella and Dover Cut were made in their respective creeks. So here is Umbrella Creek and Dover Creek, if you can visualize that previous map. Um, in 1932, the Corps of Engineers came back and um, redug noise cut with machines in order to help with log transport. And then in 1939, the alternate intercoastal waterway cut was made. Um, and that was, we have these small series of other cuts that were made during that time period. Um, but we're going to concentrate on the effects of what we think noise cut does um, to the Satilla River system. So this is what we think happens with water flow um, in the Satilla River estuary, specifically Umbrella and Dover Creeks. So I've brought back this hand-drawn map. So here is Umbrella Creek here and Dover Creek here. And so on the satellite image, here is Umbrella Creek and Dover Creek, and this bold line here signifies what we think the flow was in 1900, about the time of this map drawing. So the main flow was in and out of Umbrella and Dover Creek. So if we take into account all of the cuts that were made after that surveyed map, so 
we see a bulk of our flow now coming up Dover Creek, as well as a bulk, bulk of the flow coming in, in and out of noise cut, um, and this small cut that's that was already here um, um, naturally um, because of the Satilla River system. In this Piney Bluff area where we have this these two arrows, we actually see bi-directional flow immediately following a high tide. So once tide starts to, to fall, we see water rush out Umbrella Creek, but a main proportion of the water flows back down Umbrella Creek, out Dover Creek and alternate intercoastal waterway, as well as at noise cut. So we think noise cut is disrupting flow by acting like a straw on the main channel of the Satilla River. Okay, and then hence changing the things that we discussed about in our introduction. So what do we do to uh, study the fish assemblages in this area? So again, this is another satellite map. Call your attention to Jekyll Island, St. Andrew Sound. Um, and here is the Satilla River system. Here is Umbrella Creek, as well as Dover Creek, and here is our noise cut. So we had three collection sites on the north side here of the Satilla River. We had noise cut itself, this node, this Piney Bluff node area, and this Parsons Creek area. Our Todd Creek, which is on the south side of the Satilla River, was used as our control um, based on the history of this region of the salt marsh on the southern side here, we know that it hasn't been cut, so that's why it made a good reference site. So we used two sampling methods. We used gill nets as well as otter trawls. So we used 250-foot um, experimental gill nets, um, let them soak for two hours, one hour before high, one hour after. And then um, we trawled with a 20-foot otter trawl for 10 minutes against the tide once at all the sites. And this happened on a monthly um, monthly basis. Now, if you were to look at all the pictures that my students sent me during this time period, you would think that the only thing that we caught were sharks and gar, because that is the main fish species that you find um, in these pictures from my students. However, there is different species diversity among those sites. So, what you're looking at here is a graph of all five and a half years combined um, with mean total number um, on the y-axis and the common name of the fish species on the x-axis. All of the starred species here are fish that we commonly found among those four sites. Um, there were 13 species that were shared um, among the, our four collection sites, things like Atlantic croaker, bay anchovy, hog choker, um, here's our long nose gar. We did have um, our bonnet head shark here, as well as a few other species like star drum, spot, um, speckled uh, sea trout, just to name a few. When we compare this, these um, species um, over that five and a half year period, we caught 86 different species, and they are all listed here on uh, on my x-axis here. Uh, the mean for um, most of the estuaries in this area ranges between 29 and 35 per year, um, but the natural the range um, over for long term um, catch is usually anywhere between 62 to 153. So Satilla River estuaries is you know median when we compare it to other estuaries. Um, our Parsons Creek site always had the highest species richness um, with 50, 55, and Piney Bluff node um, always had the lowest. So we decided the best way to analyze this data was looking at it by year, by season. So again, on the y-axis, you'll find mean total number. And then across the x-axis, you'll have the site, which is, you see the key below, as well as the season. So in 2015, we caught 39 different species. Um, our, sum our summer was dominated by sharks. Um, and then we had a year-long abundance of some of those 13 species that we caught, like croaker, gar, um, silver trout. Um, when we compare the diversity metrics among the sites, Piney Bluff node had the lowest with nine species found. Again, some of those small species like mummy chugs and other killifish. And Parsons Creek had the highest fish abundance um, as well as the highest richness. In 2016, we caught 39 different species, and we see a, a seasonal catch in terms of um, diversity metrics. 24 of those 39 species were caught in the fall. 29 of those species were caught in the winter. Um, 
and some of the year-long residents that we talked about in 2015 were the same for 2016. What's interesting in the winter is that we do have some lower catch, and that may be due to Hurricane Michael that occurred in the fall. And just like with 2015, Piney Bluff Node had the lowest um, year-round richness, and um, Parsons Creek had higher abundances as well as higher species richness. In 2017, 2017, we caught, it was our most speciose year in terms of species richness, catching 51 species. Um, we saw a seasonal shift in terms of when we caught most of those species. 29 were caught in spring and 38 were caught in summer. Um, our winter count may be low due to hurricanes um, uh, approximately six weeks apart. Uh, Irma came first and then Maria came in September um, a few weeks later. Again, with 2017, just like the previous two years, Piney Bluff Node had less abundance as well as lowest species richness. Um, and in 2017, noise uh, cut in, Parson, in Parsons Creek had very similar um, abundance. In 2018, um, only the really the first year of the data um, can be used for our statistical analysis because we had some issues um, with um, some of our gear um, but even just um, sampling the first half of the year, we did still catch 31 different species, um, and those uh, was usually dominated by Atlantic croaker and spot. Um, we did find the same normal um, year-long residence as the previous uh, three years, um, but Hurricane Florence also prevented us from getting out in the fall. Um, and just like with the previous years, Potty Bluff Node, as well as Parsons Creek, were um, similar in terms of their abundance. So what we found was um, the sites um, downstream of noise cut, especially our Piney Bluff node, um, appear to be affected by noise cut. Um, we have some unpublished length data. Um, we find significantly smaller fish at that site, but that's because we find fish that are small to begin with, things like mummy chugs, uh, gobies, bay anchovies, um, things don't, fish that don't get very large. What also ha was not included in this presentation was some of our water quality data. That Piney Bluff node also tends to have the lowest salinity as well as the lowest chlorophyll A um, levels. And so if it's lowest salinity, it makes sense that we're finding those smaller fish because those fish tend to be estuarine residents and can withstand the, the physiological changes that are occurring at that site. Parson Creek definitely always had highest species richness, and we asked whether or not we thought that was due to noise cut. We don't think so because we think it's closer to the entrance of Umbrella Creek, and so they're just getting flushed more often. Off, there were several seasons where noise cut was similar to Todd Creek, as well as noise cut being similar to Parsons Creek, especially in terms of the sharks and some of the other species we found. Um, over time, noise cut has become a deep water habitat, um, and that may explain some of that result. Um, we just finished up a krill survey, but those results are inconsistent. Um, and we, and because mainly because of COVID um, and the two uh, public fishing areas that we visited were often, were often not visited by fishermen. Um, so we weren't able to get any of that data. And plus we're only going once a month and that may have also led to um, some of the inconsistency of our krill survey. We do know that the Corps of Engineers is moving forward with the noise cut closure. Um, and then the, the $8 million question, obviously, because this is a huge undertaking, is how fish will be affected as a result of that closure. This is, was a multifaceted project, and it goes to, without saying that there are lots of acknowledgments, um, including the thanks um, to be able to talk today. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions.